Hi, I'm Joanne McCafferty and welcome to this Antiquities Trafficking themed Google Hangout. This particular Hangout will be centred on the strengthening and development of international norms in the realm of cultural property protection during armed conflict, focusing this time on the 1970 Convention on the Means of Prohibiting and Preventing the Illicit Import, Export, Transfer and Ownership of Cultural Property and the 1995 UNIDOA Convention on Stolen or Illegally Exported Cultural Objects. So, the following discussion will concern primarily the transit and market stages of a cultural object's illicit transfer via consideration of the 1970 UNESCO Convention, which has been ratified by 131 member states, including many culture rich nations as well as former hubs of illicit traffic. According to Munir Bukanaki, it is clear that the illicit traffic in cultural property is an international affair and only international cooperation, primarily through the adoption of an adherence to international conventions, will allow a greater measure of con control in this area. For such global adherence to become a recognised norm, domestication of established international conventions is necessary. This would enable national legislation of member states around illegal export, import and illicit ownership of cultural property to be consistent with the 1970 Convention. So the very nature of the 1970 Convention relies heavily on a high level of domestic implementation and therefore acts to support national laws prohibiting the, or limiting export. The Convention propagates the global norm prohibiting trading in stolen or illegally exported cultural property, both in peacetime and as detailed in Article 11 during times of conflict. It states the export and transfer of ownership of cultural property under the compulsion arising directly or indirectly from the occupation of a country by a foreign power shall be regarded as illicit. Moreover, in practice, a moral and ethical international norm has been born out of Article 10 of the Convention, which declares that state parties undertake to endeavour by educational means to create and develop the public, in the public mind a realisation of the value of cultural property and the threat to the cultural heritage created by theft, clandestine excavations and illicit exports. Such principles for respecting the value of cultural property and the maintenance of archaeological sites for educative value have become entrenched in public opinion and may act as a deterrent against clandestine excavation and illegal export. According to Lindell Prot, the Success of the persuasive effect of public attitudes on this issue has led to museums utilising the 1970 Convention as a key marker for inquiries into provenance, thereby serving to strengthen and expand this international norm beyond the boundaries of the so-called art-rich nations to the predominantly market nation states. In terms of the market aspect, enforcement of the 1970 Convention is clearly dependent on compliance with each member state's national legislation. According to Prot, many nation states encountered issues when implementing domestic law as required by the 1970 Convention and have therefore been reluctant to ratify. This complication regarding the practical enforcement of national legislation required for the success of the Convention serves to present, prevent its aims from becoming the international norm. The 1995 UNIDOA Convention was introduced as a complementary instrument to the 1970 Convention with the aim that many of the shortcomings of the latter would be amended without the necessity of a protocol. The 1995 Convention introduced minimal legal standards for the restitution and return of cultural objects between contracting states. This thereby ensures that regardless of persistent illegal export and illicit import of cultural objects, due to armed conflict, a common global language for the legal return of artefacts would prevail. UNESCO recommends that prospective party states ratify both the 1970 and 1985 conventions simultaneously, where a country is already party to the former, it should move towards ratifying the latter, as it acts to solidify the rules formally established and consequently strengthen international norms. This simultaneous ratification would not prove problematic as both conventions are not, are not retroactive, they refer only to objects of illicit provenance, and they share the same definition of cultural property. So this thereby establishes a common global language for the strengthening and development of normative ideals against looting and trafficking in cultural property, 
and facilitates a platform for a new norm defining globalized standards for the restitution of illicitly trafficked and owned cultural objects. With little unification on the topic of restitution prior to the 1995 convention, the law often favored the market country, particularly where a lack of evidence was highlighted, with many cases failing due to the statute of limitations. Article three of the 1995 convention, however, identifies cultural objects that are not subject to the statute of limitations. It states a cultural object forming an integral part of an identified monument or archaeological site or belonging to a public collection and sacred or communally important cultural object belonging to and used by a tribal or indigenous community in a contracting state as part of that community's traditional ritual use. The steady development of the international conventions as discussed has encouraged the establishment of moral and ethical norms which have the potential to formulate global compliance through the internalization of said conventions. The simultaneous ratification of both the 1970 and 1995 conventions would allow for the optimization of the political mo momentum achievable at national level in the fight against illicit traffic and their legal and practical implementation at national level. This momentum towards domestication of international conventions is key to their effectiveness, particularly when considering the shift from the establishment of mere moral and ethical norms to customary international law. So in my next and concluding hangout in this series, I will be considering the need for domestic implementation of such international conventions, as well as the role of IGOs in their global application. Again, thanks for listening.